for the Center for the Study of War Experience. Um, I was a Regis undergrad. Actually, Gus was in a few of my history classes, actually, when we were undergrads, like, what, a decade ago. Um, yeah, we're, we're so glad to have um, everybody here tonight. Uh, this is my first Zoom event, so I'm getting still kind of getting used to this new new age that we're in. Um, yeah, so thanks so much for joining us as we talk to um, talk about Regis's uh, The Ties to the Liberator, which was first you know, a best-selling book and now a Netflix miniseries, which I hope, I hope most of you have been able to watch. If not, I'd recommend it highly. Um, so before we get started, I wanted to just do a few reminders um, for our Zoom event here. Um, one is to stay muted, please. That really helps with our sound quality and also helps um, us, you know, have Sam's kind of our featured speaker tonight. So just stay muted. Um, if, you, if you're not muted, go ahead and put yourself on mute. And so we do, I'm going to ask Stan questions at the beginning. I have a few questions for him to get us going. And then if you'd like to ask a question, if you look down on your screen, there's a, a chat function. So if you click on that, um, you'll see that a box comes up and you can type in a question there. So once, once I run through my questions, then I'll open it up to audience questions. And so just feel free to type in your questions there. So. Um, Great. I think that's all the reminders I have. I do want to say a big thank you to a couple of people who um, helped make this event possible. And that's Amber O'Connell, which she's actually, I can see she's on the phone right now trying to get people on, <laughs> on the Zoom call. So I just want to acknowledge um, Amber. She did a phenomenal job and it was really wonderful working with her. So um, I'd love to, I wish we could all give her a big round of applause. So <laughs> if we were together, we could do that. But so big thank you to Amber and the other folks at the alumni office and Fergal, um, Jen Forker for what she's done to help us with our marketing. So just wanted to say big thank you. And moving on here is to our featured speaker, Dan Clayton, Dr. Dan Clayton, who, as maybe some of you heard um, as you're logging on, he, he is now retired. He's Professor Emeritus. Um, he left a, a wonderful legacy at Regis, a long career. Um, I'm, I was a history major because of Dan, and I stayed a history major, and look at me now, so thank you to Dan, big thank you. Um, so a part of that legacy is really starting the Center for the Study of War Experience, which came out of the popular series, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with, Stories from War Time. So um, with that, um, I wanted to ask Dan, um, how or when did you meet Felix Sparks, and when did he become a part of um, Stories from War Time? I met Felix Sparks, um, I remember it very vividly. Um, it was at the Memorial Day Parade in Denver in 1995. We were getting prepared to do our first stories from wartime. We called it then Remembering World War II. And we were preparing for the course and I was rounding up veterans to appear on the panels because we had decided the best way of teaching about World War II um, was to um, you know get hear it from the veterans, hear it from the men and women who actually experienced uh, the war. Um, and I had heard uh, about Felix Sparks actually a year before when I gave a talk to the Ignatian Society um, at Regis, and I first met there then uh, Phil Antonelli and Mike Queering, both of whom participated in our stories from wartime for uh, years and years and years until their deaths. And they began telling me about if we're going to have one single person that we must have associated with the Regis program that we must hear from. And that was from General Felix Sparks. So I began doing research on, um, on General Sparks right after the war. He had uh, reorganized and reestablished the Colorado National Guard. He was commander there for about 10 years. He was a district attorney. He was a Colorado State Supreme Court Justice. And just about the time that I first met him during that parade, he had just succeeded in getting passed through a special session of the Colorado State Legislature at the time. A, an act called Punch, People United No Children's Handguns. Because in 1993, and I remember this episode, in 1993, his grandson, his 16-year-old grandson, was killed by a 15-year-old in a drive-by shooting. Uh, 
It was something that haunted him all of his life. In fact, rather than being buried at Arlington Cemetery, General Sparks is buried next to his grandson in Colorado. So I, I knew about him from that. His, he took on the NRA in that particular episode and, and in fact won. So that punch law was passed, which uh, forbid the use of handguns uh, for children under 18 years old. He made a point of telling people, and he told that at Regis, there were more people killed by handguns, right, in that particular year than all the people who died under his command during the whole course of the Second World War. So he took it very seriously. He was, he was just haunted by the death of his uh, grandson. At any rate, he was the Grand Marshal of the big 50th anniversary commemoration of the Second World War Memorial Day Parade, right? And um, so I was downtown watching the parade and the governor came by in a vintage car and the mayor and all the celebrities. That was the first time I saw the 442nd Gopher Broke Japanese Combat Regimental Team. Uh, it was a wonderful, wonderful event. It was, it was just great. I mean, all the hoopla attendant to the 50th anniversary of the Second World War was being commemorated and celebrated. Felix Sparks, the Grand Marshal, did not ride in any of the vintage cars. He marched the whole parade route, right, in his World War II uniform, right? He was the soldier's soldier. And after the parade, I kind of followed where he just kind of gathered by himself over on the lawn area. Uh, he was smoking a cigarette, still in uniform, and I went up to him and I introduced myself. He was very gruff. Yeah, what do you want? That kind of, that kind of approach. And I indicated that um, um, what we were doing at Regis, we were starting the course called Stories from Wartime, Remembering World War II. And I was hoping that he might want to participate in the program. He seemed quite reluctant uh, at first, but then he mentioned that he did have a Regis connection, that his granddaughter, I think it was his granddaughter, had actually had a degree from Regis or was pursuing a degree from Regis in nursing. And that therefore was the, the entree. And so from then on, um, that very first year, Felix was on our panel and he gave uh, a major lecture on his war story. So that's how I got to know Felix Sparks, was that, vet, that Memorial Day parade, the Regis connection with, with a member of his own family going to Regis for nursing, hearing about F Sparks from our World War II veterans who also participated in the program right from the very beginning. So it was a Regis connection right from uh, the beginning with, with Felix Sparks. And as, as the audience knows, Felix Sparks is the subject of both the book, The Liberator, and of course the, the Netflix miniseries, uh, The Liberator. He is the liberator, in fact. So that's how I got to know him. Oh, great. And so um, at what point did you meet or um, cross paths with Alex Kirshaw? I'm just curious how that came together. Alex Kirshaw was actually uh, doing an interview with Rick Crandall on KEZW Radio, 1430 AM. Rick was the morning show host, station manager of KZW, the oldies but goodies station, did the songs of the 40s and 50s. I was a fan, I listened to that show. So um, uh, he had interviewed Alex Kirshaw on his show and I met Alex Kirshaw through Rick Crandall because Alex was in Colorado Right, doing research for what would become his book, Escape from the Deep, which was published in 2008. It was about the sinking of the USS Tang, a submarine that was hit by its own torpedo that went awry, right? The, the, the submarine was sunk and there were six men who escaped from that deep through this escape hatch that had never been used before. And Clay Decker, who was from Denver, who had I had interviewed, right, was one of the men who escaped. So Alex then began to use our materials in our archive, which we had established with the Center for the Study of War Experience, to research and write about Clay Decker, one of those survivors of that submarine sinking at the end of the Second World War. Uh, so that's how I got to know uh, Alex Kirshaw. And I had used his book, The Bedford Boys, um, which he had published in 2001 several times. I thought it was a great book about uh, World War II and those you know, high school students from Bedford High School in Virginia who had gone off to, to war and 
18 out of 22 in that particular class in Bedford were killed in the first 10 minutes in Omaha Beach, the Green Sector at Omaha Beach on June 6, 1944. So that's how I got to know Alex Kershaw. And that's when he began doing research uh, on The Liberator. Uh, it was published in 2012. And I had done um, a very long interview with General Sparks. We went over to his, we, uh, Phil and Eric Steinmates, who took their film cameras and we kind of set up. I had, uh, uh, General Sparks had talked at the Regis program for two or three years uh, on our panels, giving lectures about his war story. Uh, and then we did this very long interview uh, with him over four hours at his house. I'll never forget that uh, either because we, we got to the door and I had already, you know, he knew that I was coming. I'm sure he knew that I was coming because I called him several times to make sure everything was, was fine. He opens the door, he's standing there in his pajamas. He was in his pajamas. Um, and he said, what do you want? And I said, well, we're, we're here to, to do the interview. He says, I don't know what I've got to say about this. You know, he went through this whole thing. But four and a half hours later, we came out uh, with, um, you know, really valuable material for the archive. And it's an interview that Alex uses throughout the book, The Liberator, right? Uh, it's, it's a way that he uses the Regis interview and the, and the lectures that Sparks gave at Regis as really a way to frame the story, right? There are any number of places in the text where he um, cites dialogue from Sparks or Sparks words that he took directly from the interview. So it was, I think, you know, when he wrote the book, he inscribed in his page that he inscribes, he says this about me. He says, for Dan, the best mentor any historian could have, thanks for making this book, Alex Kirshaw, for making this book. And it had to do with those interviews. Again, they're used extensively throughout the book to frame the story, to drive the narrative. And so he drew, he, he drew on these interviews and the lectures as, as major sources of information about Felix Sparks' war story. In his acknowledgments to the book, he says this, the amazing Rick Crandall, that is to say, Alex Kirshaw, right? The amazing Rick Crandall in Denver first introduced me to Regis University's Professor Dan Clayton, director of the Center for the Study of War Experience who conducted several lengthy interviews with Felix Sparks, which were absolutely essential to this book. I can never thank Rick or Dan enough for their wonderful support and generosity. Dan has done more to promote a true understanding of the war than any other scholar in the United States. Alex Kirshaw also likes to use hyperbole a lot too, right? Uh, that's probably a great exaggeration, but he was very generous. And he talks about Phil and Eric Steinmates and about granting permission to use the recordings. He talks about Nathan Matlock at Regis, who was, was assistant director then, also helped me interview several veterans in Denver because the 157th Infantry Regiment that, that Sparks commanded, right, uh, had reunions in Denver that he would help organize. And so we interviewed several of the members of the 157th Infantry Reg Regiment, etc. So this is how Regis and the archive and the resources of the archive, uh, you know, became important um, uh, sources of, of information about Felix Parks. Yeah, um, I did have a question that just popped into my head here, Dan. Um, so he went to, you know, Felix Parks was going to Stories from Wartime, and I've been, you know, at Stories from Wartime for years now, and I see the impact that seeing that hearing the first you know, hand accounts of these veterans who are, you know, it's a big impact for our students. So I'm curious if you remember, um, before we get going on the book here, like what was, what did, what was the room like when Felix Sparks was there? What was, what was, what did it feel like to be interviewing him or, or what kind of impact did he have on the students? Well, it was, it, it was exciting to interview him, but he was, he was very serious minded and he was very uh, intent on making sure that students understood the meaning of war. He, he was very intent on having students understand what war was really like, you know, the unvarnished truth he wanted to get across uh, to the students. And I'll, I'll never forget that very first um, uh, panel. Uh, he gave a lecture, then he was on the panel subsequent to that. But in his lecture, I had asked him, and this is really important, I mean, he was the soldier's soldier. He read the book. He had been through so much. 
I mean, he lost, he, he loses a whole company at Anzio. He loses a whole battalion at the Battle of Reipert's Villa in the Vosges Mountains, right? And there are a couple of things that drive the narrative of the book. One is how could the men continue to go on? And that drove him to why did they continue to fight on having suffered so much? And when after that first talk at Regis, I asked him, I was moderating the panel then, you know, what was, when all was said and done, what was the meaning of the war, right? You could have heard a pin drop. I mean, his, his talk was riveting, especially when he talks about Dachau, and what happened at Dachau, which, which we'll talk about. But the thing that really struck me, and I think the students, is when I asked him, you know, what was the meaning of the war? He takes out a letter. He takes out a letter, an old crumpled letter that he continued to carry with him. And it was from a mother who had lost her son one of Sparks, you know, members of his company, you know, at the, at the breakout at Anzio. Um, and he was, the mother, parents got a, you know, letter saying or telegram that he was missing in action. And she writes Sparks this letter, dear captain, he was a captain then, please tell me what happened to my son. This haunted him. It was interesting that, again, this gruff, tough, soldier, soldier, more battlefield commendations than perhaps any other soldier in the Second World War, except for the, perhaps Audie Murphy in terms of battlefield accommodations, right? The meaning for him was a mother's loss. And then he would tell us about the times he would go back to Europe, to go back through those battlefields, right? Looking for this boy's grave, which he could never, he never found, right? So I thought it was really interesting. I think the students were, were, uh, taken aback by the fact that in his mind, the meaning of the war was a mother losing her son, right? Death, dying, right? That for him was the meaning of, of his war experience. So that was always, uh, I think, a matter of, of um, real interest, uh, uh, you know, for the students, certainly. And I think they were in awe of just what his, you know, because the men he was commanding were their ages, you know, our students' ages then. They were just teenagers. They were just young men. How could they have done all that? How could, have they, how could they endure all that? Right, and that's the question I asked him at the interview. And Alex puts this right in the prologue of his book, that Regis interview, right? Because Sparks talks about, I've asked myself so often, how could they go on? How could my men continue to fight on, right? And that's the question you know, that Alex uses also to drive the narrative of the book, The Liberator. And that's a kind of common theme through the book. And you get it in the series as well. How could they do this? How could they endure all this suffering, right? At, at Rikersville, he loses a whole battalion, right? He loses, he loses seven company commanders, you know, 30 platoon leaders, right? Hundreds of men, 1,500 people die under his command during the course of the Second World War. Why did they go on? How did they go on? How could they endure this? And I think answering those questions was something that uh, um, really impressed the students and impressed all of us. He was someone you really listened to, really listened to. And then, of course, he also would talk a lot about his the experience at Dachau, which is why the book is entitled The Liberator, because going through all of this over 500 days in combat from uh, they arrive in Oran, Algeria, then, uh, of course, Sicily in July 1943, then on to Salerno, then Anzio in 44, you know, the beachhead at Anzio in January 1944 through May 1944. Uh, uh, I mean, an incredible battle. Thousands and thousands of lives are lost there, you know, fighting against Germany's best under Kesselring. Then the invasion of southern France, then through the Vosges Mountains, right? Villa, where he loses a whole battalion of men, right? Then onto Aschaffenburg, then to Munich, and then finally onto Dachau. Because also at that very first um, lecture he gave at Regis, he brought the photographs that he took at Dachau that day because he knew that someone were going to question this, right? Because it was already faced with Holocaust denial after the Second World War and never really happened. And he would spend a lot of his time and effort going around the country you know, attending meetings, taking on the Holocaust deniers. And that very first evening at Regis, he had a table set up with the photographs that were taken that day at Dachau. 
of the boxcars and of the corpses in the boxcar and, and of the prisoners there uh, that, that his special task force liberated. So he becomes one of those Americans who just took on Holocaust denier every chance he got. So he was an impressive, he was a very impressive man, a really impressive man. You know, um, since we both uh, do oral history, there's a way that, um, that I can get, we develop relationships with these people that we interview. You sat in his, room, in his home with him for four, four, and a half, four and a half hours and you continue to, to have a friendship with him. So I'm curious, um, there's an attachment that I get to people and their stories, right? Because it is an intimate thing to tell your story this, to the oral historian, to students, right? There's uh, it's a, kind of a special bond to forge with somebody. So I'm curious um, if you feel as if Alex represented Felix's, you know, Felix's story appropriately or in the way, do you think it, what's your opinion on the book as a whole? Well, I, you know, I love the book. I, and one of the reasons I love the book is that he draws so much from the oral histories. Right from Jack Hollowell, who was, who was with the 157th Infantry Regiment. And when you look through his notes, and I always do this as a historian, look through the notes. How do people come to right, write the narrative? How do they construct that narrative? And in Alex Kirchhoff's case, it's always based on these oral histories, these interviews that he does or he draws on from our archive, for example. Um, so that was the thing that one of the things that always impressed me about. Um, uh, Alex Kirshaw drawing on those oral histories to help drive the narrative. Um, and I love his style of writing. I compare it to Hemingway. I really do. Very short, crisp, concise sentences uh, that I really love. I just love his style. And I do. I would compare Alex Kirshaw's writing with Ernest Hemingway. And interestingly enough, they both started off as journalists. Uh, and that doesn't surprise me that they would both be journalists that way. So. I think the book um, uh, is, is one of the best books on World War II. I've always said this. We've used it in stories from wartime. I've used it in other classes that I've, uh, that I've taught because of how faithful it is to what we call getting at the truth of war experience. So I'm very impressed with Alex Kershaw's writing. I really yeah. am. Yes, as am I. And I think, you know, as reading it again recently, I, I just had another just the feeling of, of Alex's way of treating grief and trauma and suffering of war experience. And as Amber and I were talking about the other day, there's not a lot of glory in, in Felix's story. There's a lot of pain and a lot of suffering as well as resilience and, and perseverance as we know. Um, so I'm curious, now I wanna to move to the series that I wanna hear your thoughts on how, so first the interviews then become a book and then it becomes this Netflix series that's more widespread and more people are I, I would suppose, you know, watching watching the series now, they're reading the book. So um, what are your thoughts on the series? How do you think they uh, they portrayed Felix? Well, um, I was impressed with the series too. And, and I think uh, it's very faithful to uh, Kier Shaw's book. Obviously he was one of the producers of the series. So that's not surprising. There may have been, you know, certain things that get conflated, obviously, because originally the, the series was meant to be an eight, you know, eight part series with a history channel. Um, uh, the enormous cost of trying to do that, I think, uh, caught up with, with folks. And so they um, began to use this, this new technology and this new animation technology, which is placed over kind of the live action scenes, right? So these are real actors and the animation is put on top of them. I don't know how else to describe it. Those who are more technologically inclined than I am certainly know this, um, you know, that particular technology. So while it was a little disorienting at first, right, then you get into it and it was like watching, for me at least, it was like watching a, uh, a movie. But I think it's very faithful to the book. Dialogues come directly from the book. The story follows the story of Felix Sparks from the book, right? And, and getting to your point about, um, you know, his not, it's not, a, uh, it's not like a glorification of war, not at all, right? Because Sparks lost so many men. And again, the question is, how could they do this? How could they go on? And his response, because they were good men. Right? They were good men. He loved these men. 
right? He knew their names. He knew all their names of his men, right? And those who died. Uh, in part three, which is the beginning of Anzio, right? Again, he takes something directly from Sparks and from the interview I did with Sparks. It's not hard to get promoted in the infantry if you do your job and stay alive. The problem is staying alive, right? The problem is staying alive. And that's in the narrative. That's Felix Bart's war story, staying alive and enduring all these men enduring this, right? Uh, he, he oftentimes Sparks would say, and Kershaw, you know, very faithfully represents this idea, it was terrible. It was absolutely terrible. He was horrified, Sparks was horrified by the suffering. He couldn't believe that his men would continue to go on, but they did. And so did he, of course. So um, I think the I think the the series as conflated it as, as it has to be when you put you know just four parts uh, in a book that's over 340 pages or so, it's that's that's a little tricky. But I think it's very faithful to the uh, to the book, and I think it's faithful to um, to the subject matter, to uh, uh, Felix Sparks' war story. I enjoyed it very much, and Alex and I, uh, we, we texted back and forth after that when it was, I got to it as soon as it first appeared on, on November the 11th. Uh, I cried, I cried at the end. Uh, the scene with, with, uh, with Felix Sparks uh, when he meets with General Patton about the episode at, at Dachau, uh, I just thought it was just marvelous. That no one was gonna ruin the career of one of America's greatest, greatest warriors. Right, so he just tears up those papers, those court martial papers, and just tosses them into the, the trash can. That was Patton, and that was Felix Sparks. It was, it was magnificent. I really enjoyed it a lot. I did. Yes. Yeah, I think one of the biggest, uh, you know, and ways it did have to, it did turn Felix into like a Hollywood kind of character in a way of his impassioned speeches and, and the ending with Patton at the end, having this elongated conversation which as we know in the book, Felix was a, his son said it at the end of this, he wasn't, he was a man of few words and the conversation between Patton and him was a few words. So there's a way that I see in the series, like of course you have to turn the main character into somebody who's giving these impassioned speeches to get you know people fired up for him. So, um, you know, they had, to, and of course he's the main character is like one of the most good looking guys on TV right now. <laughs> so there's a way that just, you know, just to see that, that Hollywood um, it, it was but you know, you know, when you say that's that's interesting about the hot that you know that happened that that scene with Patton happened. That's oh, exactly. I know that it happened. It just like was a, in reality, as a, according to the interview in Kershaw, it, it was a lot shorter of a meeting than the than the series yeah. plays it as, right? It yeah, was a way of opportunity of showing the audience just all that Felix Sparks did. Yeah, um, right. yeah. Um, right. Great. Well, I'm going to turn over to some of our audience questions. Um, we actually just went over one, which how faithful is the telling in Netflix, the Netflix series to Sparks' stories. Um, so I'll go ahead and, and finish up from Gus here. So Gus says, so much of his story seems so, seems close to unbelievable, which I agree it does, um, particularly the loss of that Anzio. Um, do you know, Dan, if Sparks uh, went so far as calling in artillery on his own positions to stop he the did. He did. He did. Uh, and that was one of the things I thought that the series did very well. Um, uh, was to um, to emphasize the the role of artillery in the Second World War. More people died as a consequence of artillery shelling than through any other you know war medium. It it just that was certainly the case. He did call on artillery on his own position. That was the only way you could stop those Germans, right? His company is isolated right at the Anzio beachhead on the Villa Via um, Anziate very famous episode in the book and in the series. They're isolated, they're cut off. There was only one way to survive, right? The German onslaught, the German offensive, that was their mission to stop the Germans from getting into that supply route into Anzio, right? And we were at Anzio for months, from January through May, the end of May, right? Kesselring was Germany's best general, he was there, right? Major German offensive against the American positions, and there is Sparks E Company from the 157th Infantry Regiment holding them off. That was his mission, right? And there was only one way of doing that, was calling in artillery on your own position, as close as you could get. So, yeah, I, I thought the use of, you know, the emphasis on artillery was 
uh, really a good way of getting at the truth of war experience during World War II. Mm -hmm. Okay, and our uh, next question here comes from uh, Jerry. So it says, in the animated Netflix series, one of the Native American soldiers uh, was promoted to lieutenant. What happened to him? Um, so just want to note that those, the characters, both the Mexican American characters and the Native American characters that really the series, and we haven't touched on this, Dan, and I think it's an important point, um, the way the series gets at the diversity of, of Sparks's um, company. Um, so those are composite characters. Um, I think there's a, there's a few characters who have the, the names of the actual um, people who serve as Sparks, but for the most part, those- They're um, composites. Yeah. Those are composite, so they represent a group of people that Felix was with, not necessarily. That's right. Yeah. But I think, you know, the, the, um, the, the, when the series opens up, it, it, the emphasis is on that particular J company, the Jailbirds, right? And he's asked to take over this company, right? They had, they had failed their live, ire, live wire, live action exams, or no, their tests under fire and that sort of thing. They were in jail, all that is true. And uh, Alex doesn't talk about this in the book until um, they get to Sicily. And this is where he then um, uh, refreshes us on um, uh, how E-Company comes into, in, into being, that it was a, a group of um, that, that E-Company, 157th Infantry Regiment, lots of guys from Colorado, New Mexico, Arizona, and Oklahoma. Right, a lot of Native Americans, a lot of Mexicans. It was very, uh, it was very diverse. Um, and the scene where um, um, uh, the uh, the sergeant major who was overseeing the kind of the um, range training, range exercises, and they take him behind the shed, and he gets beaten up by, you know, one of the one of the uh, um, one of the troops, you know, one of uh, Sparks's troops. Uh, whether that uh, happened. I think uh, Alex in the books talks a lot about Sparks didn't hesitate to use his sergeants, right, to uh, to kind of uh, round these ragtag group of, of Mexicans, as he would say in the book, as Sparks would say, and Native Americans into a good fighting force. They loved him. That's also something that comes across in the series, comes across in the book, right, these men loved him. If you ever went to 157th Infantry Regiment reunion, you would get that sense. They really did. Um, um, they really loved Sparks and he loved them. He really did. Mm -hmm. And it's not, you know, the idea that, yes, this is a good way of showing, it's a wonderful way to start the, the, the miniseries with an emphasis on this diverse group. But that was, you know, that, that happens during World War II. After the war, kind of the hyphenated American identity kind of kind of is, is set aside for a bit. We no longer call them Mexican Americans. They are Mexicans, right? It's it's a it's America with a big A, as people often say in the literature, in terms of how World War II would contribute, right, to the Americanization, right, of uh, the American population. And, and Sparks loved his men. There's no question about that. Yeah, I was that actually the biggest surprise for me when watching the series was the focus on on the diversity of his group. And I think when when reading articles about um, reviews of the series, um, like Smithsonian Magazine and a few others, that's the focus. It's less on Felix Sparks and more on the on these stories of Mexican Americans and Native Americans that haven't been included in that dominant narrative. So it's, that that was um, something I found really cool about the series and that it is getting a lot of um, Know, good press about that just to say that it's now, now's the time that we should re be representing all the stories so to use Felix Sparks as the entrance point um, to these different groups and then develop those composite characters like we're talking about right. um, great so I do want to we have one more we have another question here and feel free folks who joined um, we're in we're in the, the audience question part of our of our night here so feel free to put a question into the chat feature here um, so another question from Jerry here is, towards the end of the war, Lieutenant Colonel Sparks was charged with war crimes, but right. later the charges were rightly dismissed. Did any other soldiers in that unit get charged and convicted for the killing of the German soldiers? No, no. Um, I think uh, Lieutenant Walsh um, comes the closest because he's the one they actually ordered, um, you know, uh, at the, in the coal yards when they've got the SS um, um, 
officers um, and troops lined up. Um, one of the things I think is very important to understand about that particular episode at Dachau, those people who liberated concentration camps in those April days of 1945, right, uh, would subsequently experience a good deal of PTSD, much like first responders today. What those men saw, what they smelled, what they witnessed, right? This, this mantra that comes out of that, now we know what, why we're fighting for, right? Now we know why we're fighting. Now we know why we're, who we're fighting against. Right, even Patton himself at Ordruff on April the 12th, 1945, when that uh, uh, concentration camp was liberated, he throws up, he vomits, right? American soldiers did go berserk at times. They did, they did have a rage about them when they saw what had happened, right? Those boxcars filled with these emaciated bodies, right? They understood now what they were fighting for. And they go, and they literally go berserk. Interestingly, um, it wouldn't be until many years later, it wouldn't be until I think 1995 when that famous photograph finally is uncovered. A man by the name of David Israel um, begins doing research on that particular day, April 29th at Dachau, April 29th, 1945. And there were the members of the Signal Corps were there, they had photographs, there was even videos done, but they were they were destroyed, so there was never any videos that we could, could be seen of that particular day. But there were still photographs, right? And the whole issue always was, where was Sparks? Did Sparks give the order, right, to fire on those SS uh, troops that they had lined up against the wall? Many of them were wounded, right? Because most of the SS guards, would, you know, who were, were um, healthy, had already left that particular uh, camp. But that's a famous photograph that Alex Kershaw uses in the text where Sparks is standing there like, like this, firing shots saying, stop, stop. And that was the evidence that finally, after many years, it wasn't until the mid 1990s that Felix Sparks was vindicated, exonerated as a consequence of that photograph that shows him clearly stopping his troops. When he becomes aware of it, right, he runs toward that place where all of that's happening, his Colt 45 up in the air, firing shots, his hand up, stop, right? So that clears him of all the ambiguities about his role at Dachau. But it doesn't really happen until many, many decades later in the 1990s that that particular photograph is uncovered and sent to David Israel. And then it becomes, when Sparks foresees it, and Alex talks about this in the book, when he foresees that at a, at a reunion of the 157th Infantry Regiment, he cries, right? He's overcome, he fuck, there's the evidence. There's the evidence he tried to stop this massacre. But he also recognizes the fact, right, that men do go berserk, and they did. They were so enraged by what they had seen. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's another point in, Kirchhoff, in the, the book that, um, that Kirchhoff, he repeatedly talks about the breaking point for men, you know, and that again is something that we, you know, we as, at the center and at Stories More Time, we talk about that psychological trauma or that um, you can only go, experience so much before you break and the series does show that and I think the third, the third episode, um, it shows Felix having his breaking point and saying it's finally here. And so um, that's one point. That, 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 you know, I'm glad you mentioned that because that's also taken directly from the Regis interview. The idea of every man has a breaking point. That comes from us. That comes from the Regis interview. Uh -huh. Sparks is telling his story because what we asked him that day when we spent over four hours with him, tell his story. We just let him tell his story, right? And the only question I would ask was, how did your men do it? How could they endure all this? Right? Then he talks about the breaking point. So that's, that's another good example of how Alex uses our material to help drive the narrative, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Peter, I'm just gonna read this next question here. Uh, let's, so, so at the end of, this is from Gus, um, at the end of, the, of Sparks' interview, oops, moved, 
um, with Patton in the series. Patton tells Sparks not to let the war ruin him. You know how Sparks' war ex experience affected him after he returned home. Well, you know, um, Sparks has the assignment after the war, after he's, he's finally, finally gets back home. Uh, he meets Mary, I think, in San Antonio. She was a wonderful woman, uh, the love of his life. Um, he gets on with life, like a lot of the, 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 the GIs did, if I'm understanding the question uh, uh, co correctly. Uh, he was so involved and so active, he's almost immediately asked to reestablish the Colorado National Guard. He sets up a law practice. He becomes a district attorney. He gets very involved in, in politics in the state of Colorado as a Democrat. Um, so uh, he really, you know, kind of moves on with his uh, with his life. And I am I was always struck by how little he seemed to be affected by what uh, clearly traumatized so many hundreds of thousands uh, of others. I'm sure he was, um, but on the other hand, it was more the killing of his grandson that affected him so emotionally. He was affected by more emotionally by that than anything he experienced during the war. I'm convinced. I'm convinced of that. That was the thing that really haunted him. That was the terrible thing. Right at the very end of the book, very end, the last page before the uh, the acknowledgments. Right. Right. Last paragraph that Alex Kershaw writes, Felix Sparks had never recovered from the loss of his grandson. The victory over the NRA had not dulled the pain. It doesn't bring my grandson back, Sparks had said. Got shot through the head. That hurts, still hurts. That comes directly from the interview that we did with him. He had lived by the gun. He knew what immense damage he could do on and off the battlefield. Given the choice of being buried with full honors in Arlington National Cemetery or in the city he had made his own, he chose a windswept graveyard where coyotes sometimes roam. Felix Sparks lies beside his slain grandson. So you have a beautiful and sad way that Alex closes the book there. And before that, I do um, recall his Felix's son does say that the tears that that were coming were decades old. He thought that the killing of his grandson opened up the floodgates for, since the war, really, and that that was the time that all the grief just came out. So it was interesting that that war, his trauma, grief, came out in that in the killing. Of I think you're absolutely right, I, and I, I agree. I, I think that's exactly what was happening with him. Yeah. He just that he could release it in that in that uh, in that way. So. So here's our next uh, question, and this is actually um, a point that's an interesting point of the book and the series. So um, let's see. There is a scene where Sparks returns to rescue his men who are pinned down by German the SS soldiers. There is no explanation as to why they allowed him to retrieve his soldiers without firing on him while seeming to attribute a sense of nobility to the German soldiers. Yep. And um, Voss, that was a pseudonym, uh, the German SS officer who holds everybody back from firing on, on, um, on Sparks, uh, that comes from his memoir. So this particular SS, um, uh, I can't remember what rank he was, but that's the 11th uh, Mountain SS Division they had fought in Finland and then had been sent back to the Vosges Mountains to, um, um, you know, to confront the Americans uh, there. Um, and in his memoir, Voss talks about the fact that, uh, yeah, I, I guess it was a matter of some honor that they weren't going to shoot on Sparks, who he then in his memoirs talks about as, as being one of the most courageous acts he had ever seen anyone do in war. Here Sparks comes up that supply road, right? His, his whole battalion is, is being, is being wiped out, and they were. I mean, he loses 500 men. He loses seven, what, seven um, um, company commanders. He loses, he loses 30 platoon leaders in this episode at, at Rikersville in the Vosges Mountains and so on. So he's gonna, and that's what he did. He often led from the front. It was, it was not uh, you know, uncommon to hear people say how surprised they were to see a senior officer, you know, leading from the front. 
that was Trump, that was Sparks. On the tank, right, that scene on the tank, lots of the Rikersville action, again, is taken from our Regis archival materials, right? What happened then, right, uh, in that particular episode? So I can only tell you that the German officer who held the fire back was so impressed with this courage. You know, there's other times when they would agree to, you know, take 10 minutes or take 30 minutes to pick up their wounded, things like that did, uh, did happen. So there was, um, I write an essay about this uh, in War Literature and Arts about they were soldiers just like us. Because one of the things, one of the refrains I heard from lots of World War II veterans in their fight against the Germans was, right, they were soldiers just like us. Spark said the same thing. Right? He had nothing against the German soldiers. Right? He had lots against the, the, the Nazi regime, lots against those horrors. But in terms of who he met on the battlefield, right, they were soldiers just like us. It's interesting in that scene at Dachau, one of the German soldiers does say, we're just like you or something to that effect. That's right. And yeah. Walsh That's really said, no, you're not. And so it's interesting because I did that with Sparks um, and we, we've heard that from our World War II veterans. They're, they were just like us. Um, and yeah, that scene is interesting with where the Germans hold back from shooting. And I did when talking about it with um, Amber as we were preparing, it's, you know, we read the book so we understand why, you know, because we hear it first. Um, from uh, Oss's memoirs, but it wasn't clear, I think, to, to maybe not as clear to people who are just watching the series that why and why and how they know that to be a fact. Like, that's not the drama. That wasn't Hollywood drama. That was a legit thing that happened. Um, yeah, that's right. Question, it was a way of showing. I mean, that we don't, we don't, in the Second World War, we don't have the, you know, the kind of Christmas truces that we had in the First World War, right? We don't have that, but there were those moments. And it's really interesting, it's especially in the fighting that takes place, right, between really hardened um, combat units, right, that you see at times those occasions where let's pick up our wounded, let's have a truce for 15 minutes or, or 30 minutes, or offering them options for surrender as they did to, uh, to his third battalion at Rikersville, giving them options. Right, you can surrender. We're going to take good care of you. We're going to take care of your wounded. But those three men, as you saw in the miniseries, also take the option of getting back, right, down that supply route, back down the hills toward the, uh, um, the command center, the command headquarters. But it's really the thing about Sparks was he could have stayed there at that command center. He goes up himself to get his men. He had suffered so much loss. Right, he couldn't stand it anymore. He had to save who he could. I mean, he knew he was under fire. He expected he was going to die, but it was saving his men. I, I just think it's a, a wonderful example of the kind of soldier that Felix Sparks was, and I think Alex does a great job in representing that, both in the book and and I think the series did that too. The the series with the emphasis on Anzil and what happened there, and Riversville, the Vosges Mountains, what happens there, Schaffenburg. That scene where Lambert, the, 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 the German major, I think it was a major, who has that, that uh, wounded German veteran, that, woman, that wounded German soldier executed. He hanged him right there as a traitor. This is what happens. The people who disobey orders, that kind of nonsense, that happened, right? And it sparks who accept the surrender, but rather than accepting the surrender at the town hall, he has Lambert get in his Jeep and has that bullhorn, you know, calling on the people of Aschaffenburg to surrender. That, that also was Sparks, right? So, um, that's an amazing story. It's just an absolutely amazing story. Mm -hmm. So there were uh, two quick follow-up questions to one we had earlier that we can answer just quickly. It's, um, what happened to the pistol that Sparks wore? Um, from what I remember in the book, it was at his funeral, so I imagine that, it, that his family still yeah. had that. Oh, they have, yeah. And the, and the other thing that, the other thing he showed us the day that we did the interview with him was the, the one of his most prized possessions was that, you know, everyone took their war souvenirs. For Sparks, it was that, that Lambert, that German commander in the Schaffenburg, right? It was his Luger. So he takes his Luger and he showed us that. That was one of his prized possessions was that German's Luger. And then the next question was, uh, there are pictures on the pistol. And that was of his wife, Mary, and their son, Kurt. Right. 
who was born after he had left, so he hadn't even met his son. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Um, great. But he loses them. He loses them when he, and, and again, that's in Schaffenberg, I think, where um, they're under fire. I, again, that was an amazing thing where a machine gun fire goes right between his legs and the Jeep. So they jump out of the Jeep, right, to seek cover, right, in the Schaffenberg. Um, and when they get back to the Jeep, the Jeep is, is gone and he all, had all his personal possessions in the Jeep, right? Including letters from Mary, uh, et cetera. So I can't remember whether he lost his pistol there, but I, I think he keeps his Colt 45 with him. Yeah, it, it did say it was on display because he had his funeral at the, the Arvada Center. Arvada Center, that's right. Yeah. yeah. So since we just have a few more minutes left, I um, appreciate this question from Gus, who again is one of your former students. So I'll go ahead and, and this will be our last question. Um, at the end of the semester and, and the seminar on stories from wartime, you asked students to reflect on what war does to men and what men do in war, men and women, we'll add to that. Um, after years of interviewing veterans and studying war experience, I'm curious what reflections you have on the big questions about war and how we remember it and the legacy of your work that you hope we all carry forward. War is terrible. <laughs> War is terrible. Simple declarative sentence. It absolutely is. It's terrible. But, and this is the big but, it is sometimes necessary. It's terrible. Death and war is, is, is not, um, um, death and war is not sacrifice and resur resurrection. It's, it's brutal. Uh, you know, 60% of the casualties in the Second World War um, were, were, were such that bodies couldn't be found. I mean, it was gruesome. What happens to the body in terms of these weapons to use during the Second World War, just gruesome to behold, to understand, right? So war is bad. There's no two ways about it. It is just terrible. But, and this is the big subordinating conjunction here, this but, but it is sometimes necessary. And there was never a more necessary war than the war we fought in World War II against two genuinely evil empires with the fate of the earth at stake. I absolutely believe that, right? And this was a group of citizen soldiers, these Americans, right? Who, uh, for, to whom we always have to be grateful for what they did for us in the Second World War. What would have happened if the Nazis and the Japanese had won? And that's a very open question. Because as you know, if you look at particular parts of the war, say in early 1942, it didn't look like we were gonna win, certainly, right? So um, I think the lesson that I've learned in terms of what the ordinary people when do in war and what does war do to them, it does really horrible things. They become traumatized, it stays with them all of their life, they're haunted by it. But on the other hand, and this is the great paradox, this is one thing I learned. The bottom line really is the great paradox of war is while men would say and women will say it's a nightmare that haunts them all their lives, it's also an experience they wouldn't give up for anything else in the world. That's the paradox. It's awful, but now that we've been there, now that we've come back whole, right, we have explored a part of our soul that very few others get to do, right? And I think there's that, that paradox of war probably would be my final concluding kind of, you know, kind of uh, the meaning of war. It's paradoxical. Thank you, Dan. It's always a pleasure to hear you talk and we're glad you can, can come out of retirement to join us for these kind of events while you're in upstate New York. So thanks again so much um, for joining us and thanks to everyone for joining us tonight. I just wanted to well, I'd love to, if we could all just give a round of applause. I mean, call, call me old fashioned, but it'd be great to have a collective kind of end the evening. Um, but